Welcome back, everybody, to Left Reckoning. David Griscom here. I'm really excited to be joined uh, this afternoon by Andrew Hairston, who is a civil rights lawyer who's running here in Austin for Justice of the Peace in uh, District 1. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us today, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor to join you, David. Well, I'm really excited to talk a little bit um, about this campaign. You know, we talked with um, Bob Libel last week um, about his run for Travis County Commission. Um, and, and one of the big themes we're getting here is how important it is for democratic socialists and, and for the left to really take these local races seriously, because you can do a lot of good um, for people with it. But before we get into the position and, and, you know, the politics around that, could you just introduce people to you? Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and like what really gets you motivated in politics, social justice and civil rights. Totally. Yeah. I'm a black Southerner and civil rights lawyer, first and foremost. And I've developed this deep zeal for social and racial justice over 30 years, my age and my professional career. I really went to law school thinking that I would be perhaps a public defender. And then after my second year really commenced, Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. So I shifted my focus a bit in my career to more impact litigation and policy work in achieving racial justice. And so in the first few years out of law school in DC, I really honed in on that passion and then moved to Austin in 2019 to further develop it by working mm -hmm. at Texas Appleseed. And I think my understanding of racial justice advocacy in the 21st century of being a black lawyer at this time in history really pushed me in this moment, really in the middle of 2021, to consider running for office as a democratic socialist and has culminated in quite the campaign leading up to the March 1st primary. I mean, it's uh, it's it's certainly been a really exciting campaign to see the, the response so far. Um, but could you explain to folks who might not be familiar with the position Justice of the Peace, what it sort of is and yeah. why is it important for us as you know leftists and democratic socialists to care about? Totally. So Justice of the Peace is a low level judge. If you will, it might be the one court that you would most likely be mm. uh, entering if you're a litigant. And it covers in Texas, in Travis County in particular, things ranging from small claims and misdemeanors all the way to eviction proceedings. Mm. And you make a very salient point about the reception of the campaign. We've been blown away just door knocking and chatting with folks in East Travis County to say that twofold. We're going to address the school to prison pipeline by taking on the truancy referrals that land a lot of kids in JP court, right? Just further criminalizing mm -hmm. their behavior and maybe their absenteeism. Uh, and then to look at the eviction proceedings where even when the CDC eviction moratorium was in place, the incumbent did not fully and zealously honor the tenants of that program and was inclined to evict tenants fairly early on in the pandemic. So yeah, just to the piece, a pretty low key role, but significant amount of power. Mm -hmm. And it affects a lot, like that's a lot of people's like experience with dealing with the state and the justice system in general, right? And, on, you know, on your end too, I mean, the, the evictions have been a big part of this campaign along with other really important issues. And I, I, I think that's really important because, you know, as we're fighting in other ways to like increase rental protections yeah. um, for people, uh, the current state of play for most folks um, in Austin uh, compared to other parts of the country when it comes to tenant protections, it's, it's not as great as uh, we'd like it to be. Totally. Now, what was very interesting for me a couple of weeks ago the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court, Nathan Hay, who's a Republican. Mm -hmm. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, the New York Times op-ed. So interesting to say that even from our perspective in the judiciary, evictions have grown untenable over the past few decades. And certainly the pandemic has shown a light on just how quickly judges and judicial officers are willing to displace people and mm -hmm. take away this vested property right that is their home and plunge them into chaos unnecessarily. You know, reading that op-ed along with evicted poverty and profit in the American city by Matthew mm -hmm. Desmond is just really shining a light on, it does not have to be this way. 65, 70 years ago, it might have been in the community that Matthew Desmond analyzes and evicted, it's Milwaukee, 
it's like there were one or two evictions per week, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and at the stage that he's writing the book, maybe in 2008, 2009, it's several per day in specific neighborhoods. So, yeah, I think, you know, we got to understand now that this is a, a critical point for folks two years into the pandemic, kind of with a broad recognition that folks do not have to be displaced from their homes and it doesn't have to be done so callously. Yeah, and it's, it is not helpful. I mean, uh, you, you note on your website, and it's something that I really liked um, about how you see the position. You said, I see the justice um, of the peace as an empathetic protector of our neighborhoods and our family when they're in need. I want to keep our children in schools and keep our families in their homes. I mean, you've touched on that a little bit, but could you sort of expand on that? And, you know, particularly, I mean, like, this is changing the way, in my opinion, um, the way that we can see our, our government and, and, and authority, right? Like if we're putting people in our community who are looking out for working class people, for people of color in these kind of positions, we don't have this kind of, you know, hard state apparatus that is sadly the experience for most people. Mm, love this point. Ours is a broad, really revolutionary view of public safety. And admittedly, there was a tension for me because as a socialist, I think I was drawn to run for the position, but I'm also a prison industrial complex abolitionist mm -hmm. and working to see the end of police and prisons in my lifetime, or at least contribute in that black liberatory tradition to the end of these oppressive, brutal systems, right? And the abolitionist part of me was thinking, well, is it worth it to run for elected mm -hmm. office, right? I'll be kind of sitting with the position and seeing with its roles and responsibilities and kind of understanding it more. It's like we really can have an affirmative vision of public safety where children are allowed to go to schools where not only they're just existing, but they are thriving, they're flourishing, where their intellectual curiosity is allowed to grow you know, as much as they want it to and check out various disciplines that they're interested in. And to think about their families where increasingly because of the brutality of capitalism, a lot of us have had to rely on collective economics and maybe live with multiple generations in our family to think that if I'm a child, I could have access to my great grandmother, right? And this person could be with me and be an integral part of my rearing. And when she passes on, you know, we know that we have her memories and her home. Right, to mm -hmm. continue our family legacy and to understand that, you know, many generations into the future will be telling her story, our descendants will be telling our story, right? And we can kind of rely on that safety and assurance. I mean, I I, I really hear you and you know, as somebody who's from Austin and, you know, grew up here and I've, I've seen just the, you know, people talk about the changes in the sense of like, oh, well, you know, the restaurants have changed. It's like the people have changed um, and, and seeing so many people, um, you know, really losing their homes, particularly um, in, in East Austin, but even in South Austin, where I'm from, um, you know, I talk, we talk about the housing crisis a lot on this program, Left Reckoning, but, you know, could you sort of tell us your perspective on like what the housing situation is Austin I um, mean, Austin is currently like, and in particular, like the current state of working class uh, renters. So we saw the New York Times was a, a big focus of this interview, right? Chief Justice Hex op-ed. And then in November 2021, the paper published an article to reflect on how expensive Austin is, uh, potentially mm -hmm. one of the most expensive cities in the United States at this juncture of history. And you got to understand you know, me, I've fallen in love with Austin over a two and a half year period, right? I definitely mm -hmm. did. It's a lore. You know, have found a deep sense of community, wonderful folks, both in my neighborhood and larger community, who I'm just so honored to be with in this city. But to know that as a working class but salaried person, right, mm -hmm. and a single person as I am, you know, there is a kind of precarity to it, right? You know, I'm doing all right right now, but, you know, kind of seeing these rising rents, seeing the allure of Austin being made known to many folks who are moving day by day, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if there are not affirmative programs to go to that earlier answer, to really stabilize rents, to make sure that folks have access to homes in a way that's not prohibitive and eating up half or more of their paycheck, 
then we're going to see, unfortunately, mm -hmm. mass displacement. And already early in 2022, it's been business as usual in precinct one of JP Court, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we're in 2019, pre-pandemic, right? Saw reports on Twitter and through other anecdotal forms of evidence that folks are getting put out in the street, in their cars, right? In one of the worst phases of the pandemic with the Omicron surge. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that contextualizes where we are in Austin, right? It's a city of great potential, of wonderful history, but we recognize that if it doesn't have affirmative programs set in place, and that's why I'm so grateful to Bob mm -hmm. for running, right, and, and looking at commissioner's court as a way of engagement, then a lot of folks can stand to unnecessarily suffer. Yeah. And, you know, this is something I said uh, to, to Bob, um, too, is like, you know, when we're talking about displacement and these changes, it's actually not to sit here and be like, you know, Austin's closed and we don't want people to come here. I mean, you're a great example of, of wonderful folks who have come here. I mean, like, that's why I love um, being from the city so much is that it's been like a safe haven and like a refuge for people from all over the state and, and also from all over the country. And like, I want that history to continue. What worries me is that you're seeing rents increasing and then the things that are coming in afterwards aren't for, you know, the people of those neighborhoods are particularly just people who work for a wage for a living. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I, I do see these things like from what Bob is doing is sort of dealing with like the income stream of the, of the county and dealing with how we're dealing with big corporations that are moving here mm -hmm. and, you know, working to curb um, these kind of unfair um, e evictions and, and bolster our, our, our powers like the other side and make sure that we can protect, you know, the things that we have from, you know, speculation. But, when you're talk, you're you know you're going out in the community, which is um, you know always like a really enriching experience. Uh, you know, people get nervous. People love that. <laughs> Sorry, I canvassed last night. I usually canvass four days a week mm -hmm. and go and knock on doors for folks. And, and folks are willing to give me a shot because they're like, "Oh, you're the man on the door hanger. You're the politician." <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, y'all. I'm that committed to it." <laughs> That's beautiful. Rain, sleet, and snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, uh, it's it's definitely coming down now. Um, well, I mean, you know, people usually have like, I, I understand it because it's a little bit, you know, anxiety inducing to go and talk to somebody you don't know, knock on their door. Um, but I will tell people that the vast majority of the experiences that you'll have with people are, are positive. And I'd just be curious to hear, um, you know, just what people have been sort of saying to you, um, you know, when you talk to them about what issues matter to them and, and how they're feeling about the campaign in general. Yeah. I lead with the school to prison pipeline issue and people are absolutely taken mm -hmm. up. They want to hear it, you know, whether they are non-parents, whether they are grandparents, whether they're younger voters, right? Folks mm -hmm. are really drawn into that message. And I think they understand how the criminalization of young people, especially black and brown children, LGBTQ young people and kids with disabilities has just continually grown over the past several decades and no meaningful supports have been put into place to give mm -hmm. these children an opportunity to thrive in their schools. And so folks have really loved hearing about the plans to put a significant cog in the wheel of the school prison pipeline by trying to end truancy referrals. There's currently an intergovernmental <laughs> agreement between four JPs in Travis County and Austin Independent School District where it's mm -hmm. on the books that children who are referred to the truancy system will go to JP court, but you know, everything in my power will lead me to push those children right back into the classrooms and say supports need to be offered to them, especially at this phase of the pandemic. And then the housing piece is very resonant with folks as well. To mm -hmm. talk about housing as a human rights framework, right? As a judicial candidate, I'm trying to be mindful of not anticipating specific yeah. in particular cases, but to say that housing is a human right. And we have recognition from our top judicial officer in the paper of record that evictions are out of control and have mm -hmm. been for a long time before the pandemic. And there is a way to connect everyone with resources, right? We can think of mom and pop landlords. We can think of mm -hmm. renters in the city, right? So many tenants where everybody can maintain their home, can be made whole, right, for those landlords who are looking for kind of cash flow. 
uh, and mm-hmm. everybody can thrive. It doesn't have to be a, a either or situation. I, I like that. And, um, you know, just going back a little bit to the, the school to prison pipeline aspect, it's like, you know, these things are, and there's some controversy. I know some people don't like, you know, a, a court officials being elected, but um, I will just say this, like, you know, these things are done in our name as like a democracy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and people don't want, uh, I would argue, the vast majority of people don't want to see, you know, young kids um, having this horrible mark on their record being sent. Um, you know, into these uh, unfortunate situations for, you know, again, like, you know, very, very minor infractions um, that are extremely punitive. And um, again, like bringing that uh, to the people in this way, I think is, is, is very helpful saying like, do you want this done in the name of your community? <laughs> do you want this done to your neighbors? Do you want this done to your neighbor's children? Um, and yeah, I think that's a very powerful uh, message that's been, that seems to be resonating with folks. Yeah. Well, um, in the last couple minutes, um, I wanted to talk to you, um, you know, specifically about um, how you're planning on on using uh, this office, right? Particularly as a member of of the DSA and of this movement, um, you know, how are you planning on on using this office as a way, you know, to help build a community, but also start building a working class power because. That's a community that has been really left out of the decision making process, um, not just in like, um, you know, like city government and, and, and state government, but very directly um, in our judicial system. Yeah, I am so proud to be a card carrying member of Austin DSA and DSA at large. And through the organization, I've gotten an even stronger sense of community. I know I reflected on that in the previous answer, but the opportunity to hone in on organizing skills. I'm a little reticent to call myself an organizer. I think (laughs) from my time in DC, the organizers I work with are rightfully so like, y'all are the lawyers, we're the organizers. But honestly, the (laughs) boss of my campaign, and I think that's so real, of like, (laughs) I'm the lawyer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I I organize for No Way on Prop 8. You know, Mm -hmm. I was out for a Mm -hmm. few weeks before the November 2nd election, knocking on doors talking to folks saying this unfunded mandate, the superfunding of the police would be disastrous for Austin. Mm. You know, it's the furthest thing that we need. And that 6931 margin, right, a victory for us with no way on Prop A just resonated with folks, right? And then it was a pretty smooth transition into my campaign from there. I think being a member of DSA, I want to be very cognizant of accountability and mm-hmm. want to really always uplift working class people. You know, when I was a child, I think my parents were just very supportive, loving folks. I had no idea that money was a finite resource. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think they call it spoiled. I was pretty spoiled. <laughs> but when I understood that, oh, I have to look at my money in my bank account if I spend it all, there's no replacement, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I have you know, kind of carried that into my life and my advocacy in adulthood, right? And I always want to be thinking of particularly Black and Brown working class people across the South, right? My people who have done so much, who have gotten the education and worked hard for all these decades and still at a moment's notice, right? One paycheck away, all of us, from total mm-hmm. wrong. And so that analysis will be critical for me in my rulings from the bench of JP Court to understand that working class power is fueling this revolution where we're seeing more and more democratic socialists by the year winning these tremendous elections to see council seats, to judicial benches, right, to state legislatures. And we want to continue that momentum and continually uplift those experiences and those voices of working class people as we bring the revolution home. I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a really exciting time. And I, I did just want to ask, um, you know, as you're seeing this campaign go forward, I think that, you know, for people who are in Austin, the the influence of, of Save Austin now has, has been really interesting. And um, particularly uh, what we've seen since the the victory um, last fall yeah. and now going into these primary campaigns that like there was a moment that it looked like that that might be an ascendant movement. But um, I think a lot of a lot of really hard organizing work has sort of uh, weakened, weakened their uh, position tremendously so far. Sure, yeah. 
Truly, I reflected on this for In These Times, the February mm -hmm. 2022 edition. And I think that, you know, this is kind of the call of the socialist revolution in 2022 is to get liberal folks who are inclined to go toward, you know, Bernie and AOC mm -hmm. to see that housing has to be critical in how you analyze these structural issues, right? Mm -hmm. You know, to see Prop B be a defeat for us, right, in DSA and other progressive organizations. It's like, okay, well, we understand that a lot of wealthy white folks just don't want to see people experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. But there's this opportunity here with the victory of Prop A that we don't want to superfund the police either, right? Yeah. And so there's this space in between. I think your point is well taken that it's a testament to organizing across years, right? And speaks to the power of organizing and the persistence of it. But yeah, I think that Save Austin now is in a thankfully precarious position, right? Each election they picked up a candidate or a ballot measure is a more embarrassing defeat. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> election cycle. And yeah, I think we just have to keep up that narrative. Like, not just enough to keep the police funding the same, right? Not just enough, right, mm -hmm. to say that you are engaged in philanthropic efforts through your church or private organizations to help people experiencing homelessness. Like, no, the socialist revolution has to really confer the means of production to the working class and make sure that nobody is experiencing this type of displacement. Because truly, across our hundred years of existence, of our humanity, mm -hmm. the individual person, it just does not have to be this way. This earth has given us enough abundant resources to live very meaningful, fulfilling lives for the time we're here, and then we can pass it on. I, I I so agree with it, and I'll tell you, it was interesting to hear, um, you know, the 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 shift that some people because I was doing phone calls, um, um, you know, last last fall, and I talked to multiple people who voted for the reinstating of the camping ban, um, mm -hmm. and even had donated money to Save Austin now, who were completely, um, you know, they didn't regret their vote, but they they uh, they completely had done a one eighty on that organization. Um, and, you know, I think the challenge for us is, um, you know, out organizing our opponents, but also being able to um, make people feel like we can get things done when we say we want housing for all, that we are the group of people that can provide that as a solution. Right. It's not just an idea that we have, like we're out there mobilizing and and these kind of victories all build up our, our capacity um, you know, to be able to do that in the future. Well, well, um, it's an honor to be a part of it. Yeah. I, I, I'm I'm super stoked. I'm looking forward to it um, to to seeing the results. So it's um, the early voting starting soon, correct? Yeah, eleven days. <laughs> early voting eleven starts days. on Valentine's Day. Uh, it will go through the 25th of February, and then March 1st is our day, election day. So I'll put links below for everybody, um, but you can find the website at hairstonforpeace.com. Um, Andrew's a little shy about this, but he's a huge Cowboys fan. So he scheduled an event on Super Bowl Sunday to protest the Cowboys not making it there, but there's going to be a fundraiser. He knows nothing about sports. I am a Cowboys fan. <laughs> David says I am. Yes. <laughs> I'm just playing. I, mean, it's, uh, it's, I believe it's in the afternoon. Um, there are uh, is more information on the website, but Sunday, February 13th, uh, 1233, um, there will be a fundraiser too um, in the kickoff. So people should definitely check that out if you're in Austin or the Austin area. Um, is there anything else I missed, Andrew? David, it's just a great honor. Thank you for this platform, for the work you're doing, and truly solidarity forever. Absolutely. Take care. Take care.